Once upon a time, there was a highly praised spin-off series known as Paper Mario. It was a truly unique RPG experience with plenty of charm, originality, and just plain old fun. Until one day, for no particular reason, everything everybody enjoyed about the series got trashed and out-churned soulless husks of its former self. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Now, I've made a couple of videos already going over the Paper Mario series, but that was like six years ago and they don't hold up well at all. And I probably should remake them, but I'm adding them to the upper right corner anyways. But, to recap if you don't want to experience cringe, Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door is my second most favorite video game of all time. Video on my first in the upper right corner now. Paper Mario was an interesting and innovative role-playing game starring our portly plumber as somewhat of a spiritual sequel to the mesmerizing Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. The Thousand Year Door would then come along to elevate these mechanics and the adventure to amazing heights. Super Paper Mario tried to switch things up gameplay-wise, but still held on to the quirkiness and excellent storytelling to create something unforgettable and gripping. Well, after that, they all got gimped into baby gimmick games that pale in comparison to what came before, throwing away everything people actually liked about the series to begin with, like the unique situations, charming new characters, an in-depth battle system, surprisingly engaging stories, and turning the wacky world of Mario Bros. into a believable setting that actually felt lived in. Alright, here's a little late recording since this thing was announced like halfway when I was doing this video. But I'm kind of hopeful now that Nintendo is bringing back at least some of these elements in the Origami King, though it still looks like it's trying to avoid taking elements from classic PMs while still caving into fan feedback, kind of, I guess? I mean, we'll see. If there's anything the new PMs do well, it's hilarious writing, but either way, still goes to show what I was saying. Since 2004, arguably 2007, fans have been biting at their teeth for more of that classic Paper Mario charming gameplay, myself included. So I really got inquisitive myself. How in the actual burning pavement on a fresh Georgian summer have I not heard or perked up my ears when coming across bug fables? I started following Small Saga on the promise that it was going to borrow some elements from PM. May or may not be true, but still looks really good. I'm going to get it. So why didn't I jump onto this bandwagon? I'm sure I've heard of this Kickstarter at one point. I, I ought to go back in time and give fresh out of college me a meaty slap for not playing this on release. So yes, a few years ago, a team of fans got the idea. If Nintendo ain't going to give us what we want, we're going to make it ourselves. And thus, Bug Fables. The Everlasting Sapling, developed by Moonsprout Games and published by Dangan Entertainment, was crowdfunded and released last year on PC and this year on consoles. Now, as a mega fan of a real deal, I want to see how it holds up with its inspiration. N not directly compare and contrast, but more so reviewing it with an eye on what it does better or worse than the original and judge how derivative or transformative it is. Disclaimer, I haven't played TTYD in like three or four years, so I'm mostly going off by memory and I don't really have time to play through it all, but I mean, I'm playing it now just to get the footage. Man, I really should have done it through Dolphin, but and I but I wrote this script before that, and, so whatever, whatever. Enough setting the stage, let's put on a show. Bug Fables takes place in a world of sapient insects and a somewhat makeshift medieval fantasy style society with some modern flares, where explorer teams go off to take on quests and search for treasure, including the fabled Everlasting Sapling, which is said to be able to grant immortality. Of course, the queens in their colonies, well, mostly the ants, have been spending generations and hundreds of explorers to find it, but to no avail. You play as a team of three of these explorers. V, a headstrong, bratty little bee girl that's all about that money, money, money and proving that she can be an explorer despite the hive's objections. She uses her trusty beam ring to hit flying enemies and inflict status effects. Kaboo, tough, honorable, and has an armor-piercing horn. 
He has a penchant for doing good while looking cool doing it, while still trying to be humble. Predictably, he doesn't like putting up with V's bull crap, but still wants to help her improve herself. He's stoic and tries to keep up a knightly demeanor, but opens up over the course of a game and turns out to be a fun-loving softy. Leaf, a cool blue moth, joins the other two later after being found trapped in a spider web. He's been there for a surprisingly long time and now has ice powers. Magic is a thing in Bug Fables, but magic users? All that have existed can be counted on one's hands. Magic is mostly from these mystical blue crystals that are all over the place, but even then, most people just use them as decor and for tech, despite them likely being the reason bugs are now acting like humans. Back to the character, he also refers to himself in plurals, which is one step away from being as annoying as someone referring to themselves in a the third person. Don't worry, there's an interesting plot reason why he does so. He is, at first, all confused and on edge, but once the dust settles, he becomes calmer, witty, and sarcastic, giving out deadpan remarks, although he still has a nerd-level interest in certain things. But still, he has an air of mystery and wants to learn exactly what happened to him. The presentation is almost perfect. Don't get me wrong, I think it's really good and definitely evokes that Paper Mario feel accurately, but... Well, let's start off with the goods. The graphics are solid, the art style is really cute and creative, and the music complements everything perfectly. I mean, oh man, just look at everything and listen. This, this is Paper Mario. From the menus, to the stylings, to everything else. Heck, they even got this 3D outline thing going on, giving it its own unique spin on the aesthetic. I adore the character designs. They are all lovable and creative. The writing is also solid and charming. Now, for some bad things about the style. Everything looks very paperish, with the comic book dotting and the flat characters that turns on their axis. Now, yes, I understand that's, well, the freaking point, but, well... Mario did it to evoke a storybook or pop-up book feeling, well, while there's no reasoning here, so it just feels extremely derivative. I'm mixed on this whole presentation because while I really like it and what it's trying to do, I kind of feel like it hinders its own originality. That's the best way I could put it. I mean, it does take this paperish style and own it, so I think it's still really good, but I don't know. It also intentionally tries to make it feel like a storybook, and was even called Paper Bugs at one point in development, so... Ah, whatever. Also, the sprite work for all the characters are kind of... crusty. Yeah, I wish we got more high-res textures for everything, especially the character sprites. My advice for that would be just make all of the assets in Adobe Illustrator or some other vector-based program instead of Photoshop or the like just so that you can export sprites at any resolution. Maybe have different resolution presets that we could select to balance the visuals and performance for our systems. You know, like typical graphic settings. Crustier for potato PCs, nice and shiny for mine. And if you don't want to use or learn Illustrator, you can practically accomplish the same thing by just making extremely large resolution files and exporting it at lower resolutions, but heck, Vectors could automatically let you get a game like this look crisp and clean in 4K. I, I, I want to see some PC Master Race elitist get his $6,000 rig melted by a Mario fan game sporting 4K sprites. So, yes, higher resolutions, please. Speaking of technical stuff, I do have one big criticism that's mainly personal, but I wouldn't be surprised if other people have ran into this problem because, well... I'm honestly surprised y'all overlooked this, GameCube controller support. This game does have controller support, and it has a good amount of options, except for allowing button remapping, that's only for keys. I'm mainly baffled because, well, the most fan favorite installment of this game's inspiration is the GameCube title, and people can use GameCube controllers on PC, I think the most common way is the Mayflash adapter, and I don't know if the official can connect to PC, as the Mayflash has this little switch on the back. 
Heck, people even still use these to play Smash Ultimate on the Switch, which, by the way, hopefully y'all can get this covered before the Switch release. Then again, with the way I think the Switch handles GameCube inputs, just as a standard USB controller, it may just sort itself out. But please be sure, man, I would have killed for it to work smoothly on PC. With GameCube icons, I mean. I mean, Slap City got this down pat. Ah, whatever. This setup still works under these settings. Pre-configure PS4. Set the analog sensitivity to low or your walking speed will be gimped like in the early footage I took before showing up to the Golden Settlement Town. Man, I was about to complain about how stiff the platforming was. Turns out, user error. Bad thing about this setup? PS4 button icons. Ugh. I basically memorized them by color, but I wish I could have manually chosen icons. Hey, modders. Steal Slap City's icons and put it in here. <laughs> Whatever. Any other complaints that sound rather poignant to just me? Um... Walking isn't inherently satisfying. Yeah, that's a weird comment, but it's true. And you're going to be doing a lot of walking. And there ain't going to be no way to speed it up. Except for some well laid out fast travel points. I really like the exploration in this game. The world feels both condensed enough to not feel overwhelming, but also feels really grand and open. And, spoiler alert for the next 10 seconds, I love the fact that it's just someone's backyard and that the desert is just literally a sandbox. <laughs> uh, and spoilers. Now for possibly the biggest talking point of the Paper Mario games, the combat. Ah yes, the turn-based combat. I like where Bug Fables went with it. They try to differentiate it as much as possible from a classic Paper Mario, yet still have it retain many mechanics and familiar features. Okay, so in Paper Mario's 1 and 2, you got Mario and his partner. Combat has this dichotomy of jump on or hit from the side, mostly because Mario can only jump and hammer. If Mario goes down, game over. So, at least in TTYD, you can switch positions to use the other guy as a meat shield. This is your partner. They have many different attacking options and uses in the overworld, opening it up like a Metroidvania. But yeah, it's okay if they eat dirt. Just swap to a different one. Though that costs a whole turn. You got your basic attacks, and if you want to do more damage or something, you got flower points to spend on special attacks. Attacking has you doing these action commands. Do it right like pressing A on time or holding back to release a hammer swing, and you do more damage. Or hit period. Mess up and the effectiveness is neutered, or you miss and you feel like a failure. There are also action commands for getting attacked. Hit A at the right time and you can guard against one point of damage. Hit B on a rider time and you can counterattack, aka super guard, doing one damage and taking none. It's risky, but if you can master it, the game becomes a cakewalk for some people. There are other stuff to look out for like tactics, items, super special moves, and random bullcrap. <laughs> so Bug Fables switches all of that up, like by a lot. Instead of Mario and one of an army of partners, you control this entire trio. Enemies still sort of have a diconic design of PM, but trichotic? Enemies can either be flying, grounded, or undergrounded. And, of course, each team member is specialized to deal with one of those states. V got the beamerang, so you can knock down the flying baddies. Kabu, like everyone else, can hit those on the floor but also has the added benefit of ignoring defense and flipping over some enemies. You know how Mario has you holding left on the analog stick to wind up his hammer? Kabu have you holding down and like a hammer. I find that super satisfying. Lee likes to send his snowballs under the ground and hopefully you wanna press the right button on time so that you'll get the maximum hurtage of sharding people up the butt. It's good for ripping your enemies out of their burrows. He is most reminiscent of Vivian specifically, a partner I didn't really like that much, but I've heard is one of the best in the series because fire. Fire everywhere. If you want something more damaging or covering more options, you can use teamwork points. When I first heard that, I thought they were going to be like team attacks like in Chrono Trigger or the Mario and Luigi RPGs, but nah, 
just special attacks, though you can unlock a few team attacks near the end of the game. Sadly, there aren't any super special moves or anything, so no big flashy stuff you can spend forever charging and then using at the right time. Now, there's even more depth than this in the battle system, so it may seem intimidating, but don't worry. This game does a good job easing you into all of these small but crucial mechanics. Okay, so let's talk formation. You can swap positions using the X button and then swap who you want to use next using the B buttons. Buttons will vary based on your controller and or control setup. The advantage of the person in the front is having an extra hit point of attack. So instead of doing the average two, it's three. The disadvantage is that they're most likely to be attacked. Keyword, likely. It's also likely you can all get steamrolled you'll mostly be having to boo up there, for he naturally has more HP, and when an enemy's armored, you'll want that extra damage on the piercing. Now, let's say you want to use the same character twice. Well, there's this interesting relay turn mechanic. You use this to give up a character's turn and to allow someone else another go. Now, that's all fine and good, but if they used a special action or uh, already attacked, they get fatigued, which lowers their attack by one. Oh, and by the way, the stack. It's likely you'll first encounter this when you daze an enemy in the overworld. You know in PM how you can like first strike enemies and uh, vice versa? Well here you just daze them and you get an extra turn. And then once you use it, you'll be like, wait, wh why am I sweating? It's best to use the relay turn mechanic on the character in front or if you really need to use a certain move, preferably one not relating to damage. Maybe items. Items are really good, like if characters fatigue, you can just have them use an item, no, no penalty or anything. Of course, the defending is back, giving one less damage if hit A at the right time, but the super guard has been changed up. Now it's also on the A button and has a less strict rider time, but it doesn't counter attack and only gives you two less damage. So that means, unlike the Paper Mario games, you can't ignore upgrading health and doing no damage runs. That's like impossible now. Personally, I kinda like this. Not just being able to steamroll the entire game by just mastering one or two mechanics. But I'm pretty sure many people like to play this way. Whether because of a high risk reward adrenaline rush or just the raw skill it takes to do it, it must be satisfying being on top of the world. So, yeah, yeah, for this game, don't ignore health when leveling up. Yeah, leveling up works exactly the same as in PM, being offered to increase health, team points, or metal points. And before I talk about metal points, there is an interesting thing you can do like around chapter 6 near the end game, where you can literally respec everything, like you can get all of your innards liquidized and you can just apply different stats. It's expensive, but you can do it. So if you don't like how you're leveling up, you can just give everybody different attributes. But yeah, back to the metal points. Yeah, last but not least, the medals. Recognizable as the counterpart of Paper Mario's badges. You can spend metal points to equip these things that'll give you all sorts of abilities, ranging from increasing a stat you wish you increased when you leveled up, to very specific things that can break the game if you know how to use them right. Like PM, this is mostly how you'll be refining your playstyle, and it gives you a lot of options, with many that have good chemistry. Maybe make a set where it just increases your raw stats. Maybe have a set for using as many special moves as you can. Maybe one where the do nothing action gives you all sorts of buffs. Or even have a loadout dedicated for you being poisoned, which could domino into all sorts of effects. Honestly? I think the meta and the thing most of these badges points towards is making Kabu the ultimate tank that he was always born to be. Aw oh, yeah. Here's a suggestion. I wish you could like have loadouts that you can switch in between, like one for exploration or one for boss battles. Oh yeah, speaking of the boss battles. This game has so many mini bosses, like dang, chill. Sometimes just out of nowhere. I know there are like 
four of these mini bosses made by the high contributors, but there are way more than four of these big guys. There's like 20 of them. There are also like a handful of these optional super bosses that are hard as crap. Sadly, there are no super duper extra final bosses like in TTYD, except, spoiler alert for another 10 seconds, except for maybe this fight with Maki, which, while being cool and thematically satisfying, didn't really scratch that itch. I it felt like I was just given it, not earned it. End of spoilers. Alright, so that's how this game compares and differentiates to Paper Mario concerning style and gameplay, but I want to quickly dive into some certain things that I do and don't like, mostly in relation to Paper Mario. Let's start off with some small but impactful gripes. Let's see. I already talked about the lack of proper GameCube controller support and the low res textures. Uh, oh, the cooking system. It's not bad. I mean, it's just like Paper Mario. You can cook an item or two and hopefully something good comes out the other end. But I found myself over reliant on it. Although I haven't played the game in a good while, I don't remember revisiting the cooking system nearly this much in TTYD or any other Paper Mario game. The cooked items in this game are just so good and easy to make that I found myself spending like 10-15 to 15 minutes after every exploration just quick traveling through towns, gathering supplies to cook, shuffling through items in my inventory and all that fun stuff. I wish there was like a way to streamline this process, maybe have you do the cooking and crafting yourself. Sadly, there is no scam lottery, but there is what we call the bank. How to break Bug Fable's economy. Try to amass 100 to 200 berries, deposit it, leave the game on, go to sleep, maybe also go to work. When you get back, congratulations, the game's now a cakewalk. I like the bank's inclusion, but I feel like the interest could have been handled better. Maybe have it be based on the amount of fights or traveling to certain areas or something else. I mean, I won't lie, you will need it at points, especially since certain items and services can get into the triple digits basically everything related to Metal Island. At first, I wasn't really a fan of the beeping text scroll sound, like... Sounds more robotic than bug-like, but, well, I quickly got used to it. There is one thing about the conversations I didn't really appreciate. You know in TTYD, sometimes characters will talk in the background or under their breath in like these tiny text bubbles under the main one, and how it was used sparingly and to humorous effect? Well, Bug Fables likes doing this little trick all the freaking time. I mean, I probably missed some important details because of it. Here's a tip. Focus on the little text bubbles because you can always scroll back to previous text and the main dialogues just like in TTYD, but whatever. Also, I am personally disappointed at a major lack of funny response choices with mostly superfluous results. I wish the Colosseum was used more. Like, it has like, there's like three or four fights, and I wish it had more fights, at least when you revisit it, and possibly also fighting the champion that you see portrayed. but, I mean, I'm a little biased. The Clits Pits was my favorite chapter in all of PM. Okay, here's something that actually irks me. Why is the level cap 27, and not like 30? I mean, granted, it's 27 in the first Paper Mario I just looked up, but I'm not really a fan of that there, either. I mean, not only does it annoy me on a spiritual level, I mean just round it, but it's easy to get to that before even reaching the post game. I mean at least with the bonus EXP I got from the hard mode badge I use and likely more bonus EXP you can grind from the enemy and boss rushes, but I'll get into all that later. I mean heck, I literally reached max level right after fighting the final boss. Like, I find that kind of hilarious, but now all the bonus EXP I can get from the hardest quests and the enemy slash boss rushes are just now non-existent. It should at least be 30. I mean, I highly doubt that I'll make you extremely overpowered and that it will be like a balancing issue. And heck, it's probably something y'all can just patch in. That's just something I recommend. Now to things I really didn't like. This game has a rather weak beginning. I mean, I'm sure the funny Sideshow Hat reviewer would have been nicer to this game if it had something of a start to, you know, hook you. Paper Mario had Bowser beat the snot out of Mario, which was pretty shocking given the status quo of the Mario universe. TTYD had its amazingly captivating intro, this shot, and you getting assaulted. Twice. And do I even need to talk about the 0-100 to craziness that kicked off Super? 
bug fables be like. Here's a little simple slideshow about the world and hey look, this bee's being fussy and now we're fighting someone with a Minecraft sword and we're adventurers now and we're going off to a very dangerous cave. Everybody says we're going to die but we don't care and we know you don't care because you'll know that we'll live because we're the protagonist. I guess the running with Leaf and Sputter is supposed to be that hook but eh, I wasn't really feeling it for some reason. The writing feels kind of lame at first, but it does improve over time. And I mean, really improve. The dialogue gets more amusing, these characters become more developed and relatable, even going through arcs that can get kind of emotional, and you really get invested into this well-realized world. I feel like they could have gone back and touched up the first act some, I'm pretty sure they did, but they probably should have done it more. And I'm sure all the experience they got working on this game will ensure the start of a sequel successor will be more engaging. One hiccup of the writing I felt was that Kabu and Leaf kind of blended in their personalities at points early-ish mid-game. I feel like I couldn't tell the difference. They were both kind of straightforward and were both opening up and making quips, though Leaf probably more sarcastically, and both had a nerdy soft side. Like, it was kind of weird. It just felt like the same character for a hot minute. Alright, so here's a real stinker of a story. The main villain. Okay, big spoiler time. I mean, this story and its ending isn't bad. It's still worth experiencing, so skip here if you don't want spoilers. Just know that I think the antagonist and his backstory could have been implemented into the story better. Okay. The Wasp King sucks and just shows up out of nowhere. Yeah, he was like alluded to near the start, but what am I supposed to take away from a name drop? Yeah, the wasps are being mean and probably have a mean ruler that could probably use a chill pill or two. Also, I've noticed people didn't really like the final boss due to all the revives he gives himself. Honestly, the real spoiler is that the Ant Queen wasn't the main villain. She's actually a nice character once you get past that hard exterior. The exoskeleton. She just puts on an overly stern demeanor, but really does care for her subjects and country and wishes to live up to her mother's legacy. Anyway, this villain's practically a lamer Grotus, except he had more potential. Yeah, Grotus was a very one-note bad guy, but he was hyped up, and that hype was delivered by a lightning strikes to the face and unleashing the ultimate seal of evil. The Lost King just busts through a wall, smacks everybody around with an axe, and sets you on fire. Twice. Axe all superior until you get to the end and beat him to a pulp. You learn nothing about him except for the fact that he's not even the rightful ruler of the Wasp Kingdom. Just showed up and became dictator using mind control or something. If you were to dig into the lore more, you'll find out that he was once a normal Wasp named Hoax. Get it? False king? He's a hoax? Abandoned by his parents and cleaning up trash in the Wasp Kingdom. He then luckily finds an ancient Roche artifact which amplifies magic and uses it to mind control and take over the Wasp Kingdom, and soon, all of Bulgaria. No one cared who I was till I put on the mask. Now he wants to get his hands on the everlasting sapling so that he can achieve immortality and even more power. Okay, so he's just some poor kid who got some legendary artifact and then tried to take over the world? What even is this thing? Could it be the thing that wiped out the Roach civilization? No, it's just, it's just some king that they threw in the trash, and then some old guy fished it out and gave the hoax for like a few bucks. As is, his backstory could have been so much suitable if it wasn't just uncoverable lore and actually played a part in the active story. They could have fleshed out his character more of this. They probably could have explored more into the potential message of, even if life deals you an unfair hand, you shouldn't tear down others to elevate yourself. If you make things worse for everyone, then well, that just makes everything worse, no matter how justified it is. I mean, if that was what they were going for with this character and potential moral for this game. But heck, if y'all were to go with that angle, it would have been backed up by the experiences of the playable characters. They all had bad hands they had to overcome. Kabu had his old party wiped and almost got his current party killed while seeking revenge. V's status as a bee meant she couldn't be an adventurer, so she flipped everybody off and emotionally hurt her sister while defying her role, but was willing to go back and sacrifice everything in order to make amends. And Leaf? Leaf got screwed hard. I mean, everything he knew was a lie, but he learned to become his own person, yet still respecting the past. They were all given bad hands, but they calmed themselves, pushed forward, worked hard, came to terms with the harsh reality, and ended up making everything better for everyone. 
the exact opposite of what Hoax was doing. He was dealt a bad hand, but instead of trying to make the best of it, he went out and made everything worse for everyone for his own personal gain, and in the end, his fierce sense of righteous indignation ended up consuming him. Rather poetic. And if you guys were to lean into that concept more in the final act, that would have elevated this game's already great storytelling tenfold. Alright, end spoilers and my general gripes of the game. It's, a, it's about time we give it some well-deserved praise. Now, there are some things about this game that I actually like more than TTYD. For one, remember the Trouble Center? Basically there to give you side quests that you can only accept one at a time. Bug Fable says screw that nonsense and allows you to take all the ones available so that you can do them at your own leisure. And even multitask, routing them into each other. Also, there's no stupid mandatory backtracking goose chase quest, so thank goodness for that. One major thing I really wish TTYD had every single time I replay it is some kind of hard mode. Besides just enabling double damage against yourself, that's lame. Well... Bug Fable's got one, and ingeniously incorporated it into a medal. You get more experience points while using it, and if you beat a story boss and or optional super boss, you can procure some really good medals. I personally felt conflicted when I first got it because, well, the reason I wanted hard mode in TTYD is because I played it so many times already, and I don't plan on replaying this game anytime soon because, well, I got so many other games I want to play through, man. I moonlighted in it for a while until I accidentally left it on during the third boss and I ended up enjoying the challenge and subsequent reward, so I just left it on for nearly the rest of the game. One last super cool thing I wish TTYD did is being able to replay the bosses. Well, you can here. There's also a boss rush mode and also an enemy rush mode known as the Cave of Trials, which is this game's answer to the Pit of 100 Trials but there's only 50 of them and there's no super secret bone down S extra boss at the end of it. Quick tip, play the boss rush for a bit to get those awesome item detecting medals and then come back after you've beaten the story. Another quick tip, once you got the bubble shield ability, go here. And then, once you got the goods there, go here. Be careful, the boss in there will absolutely tear you to pieces. Well, at least in hard mode, so uh, be careful. I like how this game can get dark. Like, halfway through, I was like, man, this game needs some out-of-the-blue, creepy, scary moments like the Paper Mario games. Here, it just feels very vanilla. Oh! Oh, yes! Oh, yeah, now we're talking! Another thing I loved about this game was that I gave a lot more of a crap about these characters more than any partner I encountered in PM. Possibly just because you just see them interact more. The chemistry and banter you get as you see these guys grow from complete strangers to allies till we die is amazing to experience. They bicker and banter at first, but once they start taking on new jobs, learning more about each other, going through personal arcs, and trusting each other's abilities, you can feel the unbreakable bond forming between them. And also, you grow to appreciate the reoccurring characters you meet along the way. I like how they pretty much gave everybody the ability to tattle at a press of a button and how they discuss the area that they're in. That also helps build a lot of their character and their relationship as a team. Also, in battle, whenever you tattle, or I guess in this game, spy on a foe, they'll give you their personal opinion on the enemy, of which you can then see in the bestiary. Don't worry, you only need to spy an enemy once to get all of their perspectives and also some extra lore. Also, if you've missed your chance to spy on an enemy, you can just pay this guy to fix your goof. Speaking of spying, I thought the spy card side game was pretty good. It reminds me of Gwent and Concept, but sadly, I don't think this minigame was handled that well. There's only a handful of fights, and they're mostly within the first half of the game. Also, the game itself is kind of bare bones, and, but it's still an interesting idea, and I'd love to see it refined and fleshed out and attempted again. Now, I'd also like to comment on the music by Tristan Alric. It's nothing mind-shattering like the later Paper Mario OSTs, but these tracks fit the diverse themes and scenes they're in really snugly. The midi-ness and the acoustic guitar kind of cooperates with the lower N64-ness of the crusty visuals I was talking about earlier. Yeah, although this game borrows a lot of elements from TTYD, it feels more like playing the N64 original Paper Mario, which, by the way, is not a bad thing in the slightest. Anyways, I still enjoyed this soundtrack, and it's one of those OSTs I can just put on loop while working. 
He put the whole thing up on YouTube, link below, but if you want to support him and download it all easily, he has it for sale on Bandcamp, also link below. You can't forget the best bop of the game, you know the one. One thing I applaud this game and its devs for doing is being able to match the amount of content the Paper Mario games had. There are so many things to do and secrets to uncover like the Super Paper Mario-esque arcade or getting all the crystal berries and lore books that are like the star pieces, look behind every corner. The end game has a handful of things to do like the new quests and also the boss of enemy rushes I was talking about. I played the game for around 40 to 45 hours and, well, I about did as much as I wanted. I didn't 100% it, I more like 90 something percented it. I mean, I did all the quests, beat every enemy and boss, visited every area, inspected all the discoveries, did the 50 trials, and also got all the lost lore books, which got very interesting to read towards the end. Stay tuned, the day of reckoning will come. I've had over 40 pizzas in the last 30 days. I didn't bother getting all the medals or crystal berries, and I kind of gave up on the boss rushes, but I'm content. This game will hold you over like any good medium-sized JRPG worth its salt. Overall, Bug Fables succeeds on what it set out to do, and I applaud Moonsprout Games for creating it. It is a great game, and it absolutely scratched my long-neglected Paper Mario itch. Now, don't go in expecting this to be the perfect TTYD successor Nintendo's owes us because, well, for one, it's an indie team, and for two, it should be obvious no one's going to match TTYD on their first try. But Bug Fables comes close, and, as it is, will give you a lot of what you're looking for. It absolutely evokes that Paper Mario atmosphere, and is just as massive as the game. It has a unique and depth-filled battle system, great character designs, charming writing, captivating lore to uncover, and an interesting epic story to boot. If you're starved for more classic Paper Mario, do yourself a favor and buy this game. It is undoubtedly one of my most favorite games from last year. But take heed, don't go in expecting TTYD, and the beginning is kind of fumbly. But trust me, stick with it and you'll have a great time. I definitely recommend playing, even to those who never heard of Paper Mario. I think this game is really about to blow up because it's coming to Switch and other consoles, hopefully around the time I get this vid up. I can't wait for whatever this team has planned next, especially if it's a sequel. I mean, I have some ideas for a follow-up. Probably all ideas lead to us exploring what's beyond Bulgaria. Maybe have it set a few generations afterward as we use a new set of heroes. Maybe have Harbor become a Rouge Port style port town from Foreign Trade or something. Maybe have the first boss be like Hooktail and we fight IT. If you play the game, you know what I mean by IT, and maybe have IT's weakness be like sunlight or something and you gotta bust a window. If I recall, the lore book said something about these THINGS being all over outside Bulgaria. Maybe just have them come out at night. It'll make settlements outside the place more believable. I want to visit the place Kabu is from, and I was freaking hyped to go to the village full of chestnut beetles, but y'all left me hanging. I also want to know whatever the heck this secret room's all about. But we'll see. We'll see next time. <laughs> Until then, buy this game. It's great. Maybe even give Origami King a chance. I'm TreyGamer58. More exciting stuff coming. Do the like and subscribe action commands. And until next time, I'll see you next time. So, see ya.